Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the conference. We're so sorry about the technical difficulties, but we're back and better than ever. And from here on out, we should be good and in the clear. So we're going to jump right back in. Um, we have here today Dr. Jennifer Lincoln. She is a board certified OBGYN and IBCLC. Um, she if you guys don't know what that means, International Board Certified Lactation Consultant. So she's pretty much the greatest of all time. Um, she's currently practicing as an OB hospitalist in Portland, Oregon. She's also a medical writer for multiple platforms. And she has written her own book called Let's Talk About Down There. And OBGYN answers all your burning questions without making you feel embarrassed for asking. And that book is actually going to be released on September 14th of this year. So make sure to check that out. Today, she will be giving her unique perspective on how to make a career in medicine work for you. So everyone, please welcome Dr. Jennifer Lincoln. Thank you so much, Sarah. All right, I'm going to share my screen here and pull my, um, oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. You can just give me the ability to, to share and then I'll pull yeah, up my it presentation. Now. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. Oh, it changed its mind. It is ready. Okay. Just give me a moment here. Um, and let's see. There we go. Okay. Let me just wait for it to advance. Okay. Y'all can see that okay? Okay. So um, thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm just going to give you some background in the past 48 hours in my life. My son had surgery. I threw out my back and we've got construction actively going on in my house right now. So this is a perfect example of a day where making a career in medicine feels a little tricky <laughs> because there's just a lot of things balancing work, which I'm supposed to work tomorrow. And I'm trying to get my shift covered because I can't work with my back the way it is and doing all the other things, but I will share you how I do it. And why I am still thrilled to be here. And um, I'm honored that you guys have invited me here. So my goal is to talk for about 35 minutes and then we'll have time for a Q and A and they will be monitoring um, the chat as well. So if any comments come in through there because I can't see them as we're going. And if at any point in time I lose my feet or whatever, something goes wrong, just shoot me a message or let me know. Um, and I know that we, um, some speakers I think have been using the Pear, um, Pear Deck app, but that didn't work for me when I imported my slides. So I'm using, poll at poll everywhere. So I have a couple polls here. And so um, if you want to interact, that'd be awesome. The way that you do it is you can either go to that website, pollev.com, and then it's backslash, backslash Jennifer Lincoln 397. I guess that there's a lot of Jennifer Lincolns out there using this. Um, or you can just text um, that same thing to 22333. And um, this, I'll just leave this up for a few minutes here just to see um, if, you, if this is working and if it's not, we'll just keep going. But if you wanna let me know that you're here today, um, you can pull that up on your phone. And again, if it's not working because it was super buggy yesterday, oh, it is, yay. Um, I made my poor husband work on it for about 45 minutes because I couldn't do it. Um, and that's part of how I make medicine work for me is that I outsource to people smarter than me when I can't figure things out myself. Um, so we'll just give you a few more minutes here and um, just to, make sure that you're checking in. And again, when you do respond to the questions that are coming up, I'm almost certain that I have it all set to anonymous. I'm not collecting any data and not using anything with your, you know, with your name or anything like that. All right, so we've got about 21 so far. So I'm gonna go ahead and move on to the next one. And if you didn't answer this one and you wanna jump in on the next ones, it's like the ones that are actually interesting here. Um, so before that, what I do wanna do, um, is share my goal. And my goal today is to share my path to medicine and to show you how a career in medicine can be personalized and change over time. And the reason I think that's important is because when I went into medicine back in the dark ages, um, I started med school, I think in 2003, um, I didn't know, I, you know, I thought you went to medical school right after college. You didn't take a break, went to med school, did your residency, and then you were a doctor and you worked full time. I did not know that there were really any other alternate paths. And a lot of it's because stuff like this did not exist in a, in an interactive way. So I want to show you, I'm going to show you how I do it, but I also want you to know there's many different ways to, to practice medicine. And it's not just working 80 hours a week for a hospital system or in a private practice. And I think that can be very helpful when you are trying to make your own career decisions. And while I have no financial disclosures, I do want to let you know that I'm a physician. I'm an OBGYN. And so I'm an expert in that pathway. I am not an expert in how to become a nurse or a physician's assistant or an occupational therapist or anything like that. I think a lot of what I say is still very applicable, but just, you know, when you're asking me questions at the back end, I'm not totally sure about all of that, but 
Um, so when I'm talking about my path to medicine, it's really as a, as a physician. Um, all right, so here is a quick poll. I would love to know, just get an idea of who's here. Um, so are you a high school student, college student in medical training? And then none of the above, because um, I couldn't think of any others, but I'm sure that people always fall into different categories. So it looks like we have a lot of college students. So you guys, like, you guys are already ahead of the game because Lord knows I wasn't doing this stuff when I was in college. But um, if there's one thing that's good about the pandemic, it's that we've got more online platforms like this to learn. Okay, so a few high school, mostly college students and some none of the above, um, which is awesome. So that just gives me an idea of where you're at. And then if you can do this, this is kind of cool. Just curious where you're joining from. So I don't think you can do it if you've texted in, but you guys, are, okay. My husband was like, they're not gonna know how to do this. And I said, honey, trust me, they're gonna know how to do this. <laughs> this is what happens when you're 40, 41. Um, so mostly it looks like from the US, but all over, which is awesome. Somebody is out in the ocean. That's super cool too. Maybe it's like a penguin. Although I think penguins are only, I don't know. I have to ask my 10 year old if they're in the South Pole or the North Pole. Um, very cool. And a couple in Canada, it looks like. Super awesome. I hope that person in the water is doing okay. <laughs> All right. So here's my brief outline. Um, so a quick introduction about me. And then I'm going to share with you my education, not because I think my story is that exciting, but just to give you an idea of how I did it, my pathway. Jobs that I've had since training, I'm not going to be sharing my resume because that's super boring, but just an idea again of what I've done after training and beyond and how I make medicine work for me. And then I have a couple common questions that I thought I might get asked. So I figured I'd highlight them and then we'll open it up for questions at the end. So that's me, not in a staged photo at all. I'm totally working there. Absolutely. <laughs> that's actually when I broke into my husband's office to take some pictures, some professional photos. So this is me as Dr. Lincoln. So I'm a board certified OBGYN. So that means I did four years of OB residency and then became board certified. And I'll talk about what that means. I currently work as an OB hospitalist. So I work solely on labor and delivery doing shift work. And I work 12 hour shifts. Um, I care for pregnant and postpartum people. There are some versions of this job where you do OBGYN hospitalist medicine, and you'll also do the GYN side of things and get called down to the emergency room, um, GYN consults. I get to focus only on obstetrics, which I love right now. Um, and that is a very specific um, way to practice medicine in terms of obstetrics. And it is a model that is increasing in popularity, given the ability to have kind of a more of a work-life balance, but also because for safety reasons, it's really nice knowing that you've always got an OB on the floor, especially when you've got other private practice docs who are back in the office or at home while their patients are laboring. So from a safety perspective, I think this will become more of the model. Like Sarah said, I'm an IBCLC, which means I'm an international board certified lactation consultant, which is a lot of words to say that I did additional work and took an additional exam and do additional maintenance of certification in order to be an expert in breastfeeding, which I barely got in residency. And I didn't really realize that until after I had my first job and had my first kid and realized I didn't know a whole lot. And I love it because I feel like it lets me treat people in a more well-rounded way. I'm, and using that, I'm a medical director of my hospital's postpartum care center. So we're a safety net clinic for people who deliver. And then within one to two days afterwards, they can come in and not only have a breastfeeding checkup, a weight check on their baby, they can also have a blood pressure check and just to check for how they're doing mentally. They can have a surgical incision check if they've had a C-section. So it's super fun. And it's a completely different way to use my um, medical degree, which is not just about seeing patients in the office, which I really enjoy. I also do writing. So um, I write for Flow and for Bundu. You, some of you may use this app for period tracking. Um, and um, I just think it's cool. I get to write and review content for them. And then Bundu is a pregnancy and parenting website, which, um, I guess I didn't pull that up, um, but it's got a ton of um, content. And what's nice about it is that it's written or reviewed by either experts in the field, like physicians, dietitians, nutritionists. I really like it. And they actually just got bought by WebMD. Um, so hopefully we'll be seeing more of that. Um, I also do social media stuff, which is, I think, how you guys found me here, which again, is not anything that I'd planned to do in medical school. So I'm on TikTok of all places, Instagram and YouTube. And I love getting to educate people and use my training in a completely different way and not in a way that I ever thought I would when I was going through training. And we'll talk more about that. Um, like Sarah said, I've got a book coming out. I'm not here to sell it to you, but you can pre-order if you want to, but I don't care if you do, um, which is just another way to educate. It's like my TikToks and my social media in a readable form. It's illustrated because I just realized what I love about being a physician is educating and communicating. And this is another way to do it. Um, and I'm a board member. I'm on a couple boards for the Society of OBGYN Hospitalists. I'm their social media committee chair. I work on their simulation committee. 
Um, and I love it. It's an, it's super fun. I get to work with like-minded people. That's a picture of us filming, getting our Sims ready from last year during COVID times. And I'm a board mother, board member at our local milk bank, the Northwest Mother's Milk Bank. So they collect, process, and um, distribute donor milk for medically fragile babies. So I get to use another part of my brain doing that. Um, and I'm a member of my labor and delivery birth equity collaborative. And we've been working really hard in the past year to make our care more equitable for people of all colors. So that's me and like my clinical um, picture, which seems like a lot when really, when people say, what do you do? I say I'm an OBGYN and that really only answers one aspect of it. Um, but it's just been a way that I've been able to find medicine to make it interesting and fun and fulfilling for me. But this is the other part of me where I'm just Jen and I'm just a normal human being. And I'm married to a pediatrician, which definitely helps when you have kids and you don't know what you're doing. Um, I've got two boys, ages 10 and six, who are magically being quiet right now. Um, I'm from New York, but I now live in Portland, Oregon, and I love it here because I get to do so many of the hobbies that I've come to love since moving here, such as kayaking um, and, you know, just getting outside, hiking and working out. I love to read. Tree Grows in Brooklyn is my favorite book, and I love good coffee, peace and quiet, which never comes, and um, Seinfeld because I believe everything in life can be boiled down to that. So I definitely have not lost the other aspects of me, which is not just an identity as a physician because that would just be really hard. So this is my educational path, and I'll just kind of go through this quickly, but I did go to a school that probably a lot of you have never heard about, because a big question I get from people a lot is, do you have to go to a really fancy school or a really big name school in order to go into medicine? And the answer is you don't. You pick the school that's right for you, and you do the absolute best that you can. And I did major in biology, and you do not have to major in the sciences. If you don't love them, you just have to get your prereqs in order to be able to apply for med school. And I minored in, minored in chemistry, honestly, because it was just two more classes, so I figured why not? And I minored in English because that was my fun one. And I love to read and I love to write. So I figured I might as well get some credit while doing it. I was super active in my sorority, Zeta Tau Alpha. I wrote for the newspaper. Um, I did really well in college, except for the MCAT. I absolutely bombed the MCAT. I don't even remember what my score is. And I think the scale is different now, but I did terrible. And I still got in. So it's not, it's not everything. So you try to do your best, but you don't have to be perfect to go into medicine. And I then went to Tulane University School of Medicine. I did go directly after college. Gap years weren't really a thing um, when I was applying. I think they more are now. And I think that they can be a really great option. Um, but I, was, I had a wonderful experience, um, even despite Hurricane Katrina being at the start of my third year. Um, I was able to join some clubs. I made the Honor Society, Alpha Omega Alpha. It's where I met my husband. We got married in New Orleans. We absolutely love the city. There's no place in the world like it. Um, but we didn't stay for residency because I think we had enough of evacuating from hurricanes, but we got to go to Oregon Health and Science University here in Portland, Oregon, and we couples matched, which means that we both had to get accepted into programs together in order for, a, for us to go to a program. And we were lucky we both got our first choices. And so I did my four-year OB residency, Doug did his three-year PEDS residency and did an extra year in a preventive health residency so we could graduate together. And we worked a ton. It was super hard. Residency is not easy, but we also were able to still do fun things like buy our first house. We went to Paris. We went to London. Um, we did wine tastings. We went to the coast. We had a baby my chief year, which was not easy, but we did it. And I'll talk about that. Um, and that was it. So then I graduated and I had my first job for Geisinger Health System in Northeastern Pennsylvania. And I worked as a generalist there, which means I did a mix of it all. Clinic, labor and delivery, operating room time. And I was full-time my first year and I was miserable and I really regretted my decision to become a physician. And the reason I really think it is, is because I went to residency and I swore I'd never have kids. And then, you know, I delivered all these other people's babies. My friends had babies and I just got the bug and I was like, I'd love to have a kid. And we did it. And I thought, okay, I delivered six months before the end of my residency. And I thought I can do anything for six months. And I worked crazy hours and I was separated from my baby for 24 hours at a time. And I was breastfeeding and pumping. And we had a nanny who was great, but she wasn't me, but we loved her. Um, and I thought, well, I just have to make it till I graduate and then it's going to be better. And I took three months off between residency and starting my real life job, which was fantastic. It was so fun to have that time with my son and to settle into a new area. And then I started back to work. And I will tell you, attending life is always better than residency. It just is. But it's stressful in a different way because you are now the boss. You can't just say, well, if something goes wrong, I'll check with my attending because you're like, oh, oh, that's me. So it's stressful. So you may not spend as much time in the hospital, but you spend a lot of time looking things up and preparing because now it's you. And we had a nanny who I didn't love. 
And so I just thought I put all these years in, you know, given up my twenties to medicine. And now I'm in a career in a, in a job that said it was going to be one thing. It turned out to be another. And I was really unsatisfied. And so I decided to go part-time and it was really a hard decision being a new physician, a young physician, a female physician. I can't tell you the number of people who said, wow, you're cutting back so early. What a waste of your training. These were usually older men, but I was very vulnerable at that standpoint. I felt very like I, I, I cared what they thought. Um, so it was hard, but I still did it. And I cut back and I have been part-time ever since. And I've never looked back. And for me, that is how I make medicine work. And I'm not saying you have to do that in order to have a family or to be happy. I know plenty of people who are full-time academic moms and they have kids and that works for them. And it's about what works for you. That's what I want you to take away from today. It's what works for you. And it's not feeling embarrassed, ashamed, or less than because what works for you, somebody else judges is, is not being enough because who cares what they think, right? Um, their opinions are useless. So you have to do what's right for you. So we worked there for three years and then realized we wanted to get back to Portland, Oregon. And so I came back, um, my husband went to work at our academic medical center and I decided to do locums work, which is think of it like temp work. So you don't have a contract. You get to tell the locums agency when you want to work, how much you want to work and they'll schedule you. And I love that flexibility, especially because I was pregnant with, and then had my second child when we moved back. And so I did that for a year and a half. And I enjoyed it because I got to be the boss of my schedule. My husband's career kind of got to take the forefront while he was establishing himself. I was still able to do what I wanted to do, but on my schedule and after a previous job that really I didn't enjoy, um, I was really afraid to sign a contract. And so this worked out. And then um, I signed up and I currently work as an OB hospitalist with Providence. And um, it's not the perfect job. There's still things that are hard, but I absolutely love it. And I love the people I work with. I work part-time. So instead of you know, a full-time job would be 1.0 full-time equivalents. I work 0.6. So I do six to eight 12s a month. And I work with an amazing group of hospitalists. Like I had said to before, you know, I hurt my back and I texted and I've got somebody who's probably going to take my shift tomorrow. And if not, somebody else will, and we'll make it work because we're all moms at different stages of our life. And we're all really nice people and we work well together. And we're just out there to help each other. It's a super supportive environment. And I love it. Um, And all that other stuff that I added, the board membership, Um, the social media stuff, the writing, all of that stuff I only added in the past couple of years as my kids got older and as I felt ready to take it on. Um, And I've just been able to ramp up and find that sweet spot of where I'm at. And so that's really how I enjoy making all of this work and landing in a place that was very different from where I started I'd be when I did my training to where I am now. And I love it. But I will be very honest. And so we're going to have, we're going to have an honest moment here. So strap in. There are drawbacks to being in medicine and I'm just going to put them out there but we're not going to end on a bad note. It's not work. So it's competitive, right? It's competitive to get into medical school, do good on the MCAT. And then you're in med school. Cool. You think that's it. No, you have to get into residency and then you have to get the job that you want. So there's competition along the way and you're around really smart people. The length of training is no joke. So you can get into medicine in a different way, such as being a physician's assistant and start your career at a much younger age than somebody who's a physician, because we have so much training. We really delay that and we delay our earnings. And that makes a difference when it comes to retirement. And if you're not smart and you don't invest in the beginning. So length of training can be different. I'm not saying one is better or worse. It's just being aware of that. Um, it's long hours and it's intense work. Even when you're part-time, especially in obstetrics, um, there can be some really sad things that happen. Be very intense. You know, people die, not everybody lives in any field and it's just being ready for that. Um, And sometimes the hours, especially in training can be really brutal. Um, There's that delayed income and you might say, oh, you're talking about money. Doctors are all rich. We're not, but we're fine. But, but we have to be smart. And that delayed income is just something you should be aware of. So if you're thinking about how you're going to live your life, understanding that being a physician, you don't go into medicine to make money. You'll be fine, but don't do it to be rich. There's lots of other things that you could do. And a lot of things that are a lot less stressful. Um, You may potentially end up delaying your childbearing. Some people do, some people don't, and that can be hard for some people. I'm going to be very honest. There's higher suicide rates for physicians and we, women physicians, we are the only group. I'm pretty sure this is true, but um, the only group of um, where women succeed more than men at suicide completion. So in the general population, women attempt suicide more, but men are more successful, but female physicians we're good at everything. We're more successful at completing suicide. So it's mental health is a huge issue right now. And I think that you can understand why right now, but it's, it's challenging higher rates of divorce and infertility. So the average, um, the statistics for infertility in the United States, one in eight couples are affected by it. 
It's one in four for female physicians. And yes, it can be partially related to delayed childbearing, but also the stress and the crazy night shifts that we work can, can play a role as well. Pandemics just suck. I mean, if you followed me on social media, you can see that it weighs on me and it weighs on all of us. And it's just hard. It's hard. I don't need to go into it, but working in a pandemic is hard. And so you might think, why the heck would I want to go into medicine in a pandemic? I think if you do, it shows that even you understand and maybe you're fit for medicine even more because you get it. And, and despite all of this, you still want to do it. Dealing with insurance companies. I hate them. They're the worst in the world. Fear of litigation. I mean, that's my field to a T. And you have to work Christmas and Hanukkah and your birthdays and weekends and you miss weddings. And so there's a lot of that. And then there's hurdles. So even to get to, to have all those fun things happen to you, you have to do well in college. Then you have to get into medical school. And then you're there and you have to take licensing exams. I don't know, maybe that's what these people are studying for as they look at these pictures of bones. Um, then you have to get into residency. And then while you're there, you have to do licensing exams. And then you have to do board certification, which in my field is a written exam and an oral exam, which is very challenging. And you're still not done. Then you have to do maintenance of certification every year to prove that you're staying up to date, which I think is important. So lots of hurdles. They're expensive. They take time. Um, oh, and student loans. Yeah, there's a lot of them too. So um, is this scaring you guys off? I'm just curious. Am I totally making you depressed? Are you running for the hills? Are you okay? Like you're a little like, I'm so glad I'm here, but, um, but no, you haven't lost me yet. And it's okay. Remember it's anonymous and it's absolutely okay to be like, I'm not going to do this now. All right. It seems like, yeah, running for the hills. <laughs> don't, don't run away yet. Stay till the end. Cause I promise you it's going to get better, but I think it's important to understand what you're getting into so that when you choose it, you're not blindsided and then leaving and switching and you've got a ton of loans that you have to pay for. So, okay. So we're like 50, 50. Okay, cool. All right. We're going to keep going. Um, and just in a few words, so you can type this in, um, what worries you most about a career in medicine? Is it, um, training? Is it the cost? Is it getting into medical school? Is it working the hour? Like what, what stresses you guys out the most exams? Yeah. They're hard. Length of education. Yep. Yeah, not being able to live my life, getting into med school. Mm -hmm. I think opportunity cost. That's a great example of like, yeah. Like, is it worth all this stuff? Mm -hmm. Financial situations. Raise, yeah. Mm -hmm. All the things that I worked about bottleneck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are all great. Um, and I think we're going to address all of them, but I think these are all things that I was concerned about too. And just in the length of time, I'm going to keep going, but these are all fantastic, but there's it's, so it's one coin but it's got two sides. So bad news is that in school and in training, you do not have as much flexibility once, as once you're done. Um, you have to work the hours. You get paid a crappy salary in residency. You have to work the holidays. Um, you're the low man on the totem pole. But the good news is that all of those years are limited and they're going to pass by anyway. I get so many people who message me on social media who say, I want to be a doctor, but I, I you know, I'm going to be 30 before I'm finished. And that's really a long time. And I write back and say, you're going to be 30 when you're 30, regardless, would you like to be 31 and have the career of your dreams? Or would you like to be 31 and wish that you had started in your twenties? So I'm not trying to poo poo that concern, but the years go by anyway. And residency, as long as it is, it goes by so quickly. And there are definite advantages to being a physician. And I think that it's really important that we highlight that. Hello, job security. Who is not getting laid off right now? in a pandemic, physicians. I could go anywhere right now in the country practically and double my salary if I wanted to, if I was desperate, if I got into financial straits, because we are so desperate for healthcare providers right now. So if I got in a pickle, there are so many people who are contacting me every day who are saying, hey, would you come here? Would you do this? Now, it might not be the exact job that I want. And it might not be a location that I want to be in, but if I had to, I could make money. And having that job security um, is huge. And with that income security, there is just, there's just nothing. I'm, I don't know. This is such a lame way to say this significant satisfaction with helping others. I get to go to work every day and save lives. I get to go to work every day and take people who are in really stressful situations and make their lives better. And people who aren't in healthcare, maybe like, you know, firefighting and police, that kind of thing. Maybe you get the same touch of it, but we get to do these amazing things every day and I get paid to do it. And it's awesome. I mean, I don't have to volunteer. Like that's my whole life, you know, um, that's that satisfaction. There is just, there's nothing like that. And the respect of the community, it's not about being, um, you know, trying to be a fancy doctor, but it's, it's, it's nice after you've put in all these years to feel that you are a respected part of the community. 
not in a pandemic in some states because they think that we're making things up, but for the most part, having that respect is really fulfilling. And that's okay to say that. Um, and this training opens doors for non-traditional pathways. So I 100% believe that you do not have to just go into medicine to practice clinical medicine. You can do consulting, you can do writing, you can do so many things like I've showed you what I'm doing and none of them existed. Probably even the pathways to get to them existed when I was in training. So who knows what's gonna be around when you all are there. Um, so the ability to diversify your income and have multiple income streams so that you are not beholden to your clinical job, especially as you get older, um, is really nice. And just that flexibility, the fact that you can, you can change around. And I will just be very honest, the way I was able to direct my career, a nurse could not do the same way at my point in my career. She or, she or he would have to put in their time before they would be able to request to go to day shift, before they would be able to be told that they're allowed to do part-time. And I'm allowed to say, that's what I'm doing. And it can happen. So to have that flexibility in a physician's career, it's just, it's very unique. And I think that it is one of the benefits. So here's what makes medicine work for me. Um, and this is just my story. I'm not saying it's going to make it work for everybody. So number one, I focus my practice to what I love. I could not stand being in clinic and having my last patient who was scheduled for five show up at 515, be expected to be seen. I wouldn't get in the room till 530. And now I didn't get home till 630. And I missed bedtime with my kids. Or, you know, I had to pump because I was supposed to nurse and I missed that. And that was hard for me. So to be able to have shift work and when I'm home, I'm home. And when I'm at work, I'm at work and I don't carry a pager at home. I love that. And that is not to say that being in a clinic is bad. My husband who's in clinic all the time would hate being in the hospital. And I don't like being in the clinic. So you figure out what works for you and that can change throughout your career. And focusing on it really has made me be very satisfied with my job. Also, like I said, for me, working part-time works because I get to be home. I get to be mom part-time. I get to be at work part-time. It can still be stressful as like a day like today where I'm trying to juggle a million things, but that's okay. Um, so for me, I really enjoy part-time work, but I'm not saying you have to work part-time to be happy, but I think you should consider it. Um, I get to supplement my clinical work with medical writing, educating. I love the stuff that I do on social media because as a hospitalist, I don't get those long-term relationships with patients that I do in the clinic. And I get to kind of do some of this education this way. And I get paid to do some writing. And that's really fun because like I said, I did a minor in English. I love to write. I love to use that part of my brain and it's fun to get paid for that too. And I can do that at home at night, you know, while my kids are watching TV, like I can do that and be able to help support our family in a different way. And I really enjoy that. And I think the number one thing is I've kept my interests up outside of medicine. It is challenging to do this when you're in residency. I'm not going to lie, um, but you have to keep up a little bit. And that is why I think it's important to really pick a place for training where you feel like you get, you feel like people around you are, um, you know, they're not just focused on work and there's things that you can do. We had never been to Oregon before when we interviewed, but we we're like, this is a cool city. Um, and it's fun and it keeps you grounded and it also makes you normal. And medicine is, is not just your whole life. I also have a supportive partner and, um, he's in medicine. And for me, it's important to have somebody who gets it. So when I come home and I can be like, oh yeah, you know, I had to do a stat section on somebody who had a terminal bradycardia and the blood loss was 1500 and blah, 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 blah. And he's like, oh yeah. Whereas for other people, they might not want somebody in their life in medicine at all. Cause they just want to have the two separated and whatever works for you. But having a supportive partner has been key. And he now, you know, how I told you before in the beginning, his career was kind of at the forefront. Now he knows that we're kind of with my book coming out and that kind of stuff. He's you no, know, he knows that he has to pick up some of the slack here. So we, we give and take, and it changes throughout the course of our career. I also outsource. Please do not think that anybody does it themselves, especially when we are professionals. So I have somebody, a lovely person who cleans my house. I do HelloFresh because I can't sit there and plan meals and shop. And I do like to cook. Um, I have no shame in outsourcing to the TV to watch my kids when I need to. I do not feel bad about asking for help. And I think it's very important because I don't want to spend my time off doing things that I don't want to do all the time. And I'm in a place financially where I can do that. So I don't feel guilty about doing it. I say, no, I think this is so important. I say no a lot. I get asked to do lots of things and I say no to 85, 90% of them, not because I don't want to do them, but because they don't bring me immediate happiness. And if I'm saying yes to something, that means I'm saying no to something else, whether it's extra time with my kids or extra time sleeping or time devoted to working out. So if I'm going to say yes to something, it has to really be worth it. That's why I said yes to this, because I really think this is awesome that this is being put together. And I love the, I just like, this is my whole shtick right here. I love educating. 
but I've said no to lots of things and saying no is wonderful. And especially as a female, we're told to be polite and nice and not say no, say no a lot, say it loud and don't be ashamed. And don't say, I'm sorry. Say, thank you so much for the invitation. I will have to decline or, you know, that kind of language. It's very empowering. Um, and also I have a community of physicians, moms who just get me, especially people I haven't even met in real life. I have my, my Instagram, my people there that who just get me. So whatever field that you're in or whatever stage of life, having people who understand it and you don't have to explain it to, um, it's just nice to feel seen and heard. So all of these things are what make the crazy hours, the night shifts, working weekends totally work for me. But here's the thing. I don't want you, do not let others tell you how to make medicine work for you. And you're probably saying, well, Jen, you just told me how you did. What I mean is how it works for me does not mean that's how it's going to work for you. You figure out what works for you. You don't feel bad if that's not what works for somebody else or your partner. It's all about staying accountable to you because you're the only one who can know what makes you happy. So don't feel like you have to model a career after somebody else. And I want you to know that it is hundred percent okay for your career to change over time. And in fact, I encourage it. Don't think that your job that you get right out of residency should be exactly the same when you're 45 or 50 or 55. And I encourage it because at different points of time, you're going to be able to do different things and changing your career and being flexible is absolutely okay. I'm going to jump to some common questions. Um, that's not me, but I just, I liked her curls. So I threw in there and then I'll be done. And then we'll get to some questions. Um, so the first thing I often get asked is how do I know being a doctor is right for me? And my answer is, you um, don't want to take this lightly because as I alluded to before, you don't want to get to a place where you've gone through medical school and you do your one year of residency and you realize, oh, I hate this because those loans that you take out in medical school, that upfront cost that a lot of you are worried about. And I was too, they're significant. And the reason I felt okay taking them out was because I knew I had job security and income security on the back end. So I knew I'd be able to pay it off. If you leave medicine, unless you find a very lucrative career, or another way to do it, those are large loans to pay back. So I think exposing yourself as much as possible to medicine can be very important in helping you figure it out and understanding why are you really going into this? Because if it's because your mom or your dad were a doctor, or you think it's a respected thing and you want to have that respect, or you just like the idea of money, please don't do it. You need to make sure it's right for you. And whether that's shadowing, being a scribe, volunteering, following on social media, I think is a great way. That's something I didn't have but I want you to make sure that you follow the right people. If everybody says it's fantastic, or if that person says it's horrible and everything's horrible, both of them are liars because <laughs> it's somewhere in between. So following people who are realistic, we're like, yeah, it's great. Some days it sucks, but some days it's awesome. That's really more of a balanced way to do it. So just trying to get yourself exposed to the field as much as possible. And you're not stuck. And I just put in birth control because in my mind, I'm an OBGYN. I'm like, well, you can change your birth control. Um, so it's, it, life is too short to stay in a field or a career that you don't love. And it's okay to switch at any point in time. And I know I said, try not to do it when you've got all those loans. But if you have to, you have to, because it's better to switch than to be miserable. If I didn't absolutely love my job, I would be clinically depressed and unfunctional. Because if you told me I had to show up for work every day, I never knew what might happen. I might deal with some near-death experiences. I might deal with unhappy patients. Um, then I would hate it, but I absolutely love what I do. And that stuff, when it happens, is there, but the majority of my job is phenomenal. And I've known people who've started residency and switched careers or who one of my colleagues, she's an OBGYN and she just went back to school for social work and she's doing that now too. Like there are ways that you can switch and you can complement your practices. So you're not stuck. Um, speaking to, can you have kids in med school or residency in case any of you are just thinking about this? You absolutely can. It is work. There's no perfect time. And you pick the time that works best for you. So if your parents or your aunts or your uncles are like, well, how are you going to do that? And give me grandkids. First of all, it's not your job. You're not here to reproduce for other people. Second of all, you can do it if you want to, but you don't have to. And you pick the time that works best for you and you make it work. I will say, if you're hearing this and you're like, oh my God, you just talked about this infertility. I'm so scared. I want you to know that there are ways to, you know, to not feel so um, unempowered or disempowered. And my friend, Natalie, she is a reproductive endocrinologist, also huge on social media. She has a podcast, which I love, but this episode, particularly egg freezing, if you think that you might be going past the age of 35, you may want to consider it. Um, it's just a really great thing. And I wish that I know that there are lots of people in my shoes who wish that five years ago or 10 years ago before this was available, we'd known about um, it's not a guarantee to prevent against infertility, but it's just another tool in your toolbox. So, and her podcast is amazing too, talking about, especially being a female in medicine. Oh, how do you balance it all? I get this one a lot. Um, and like I said today, how I'm balancing it all, 
I asked my construction people to stop doing construction now. Um, my other kids set up in front of the TV, my post-op kid, I medicated with pain medicine and told him to take a nap. My mother-in-law is coming in an hour to take the younger one so that I can rest my back. Like this is an example of how there's no such thing as balance. And it's more of a juggling act. And each day you decide what can't be dropped and what can be. So there are some days where I can't do anything at work. I have to be on as a mom. That's what I'm doing right now. Um, there are other days where I have to work. And if something comes up with my kids, they need to call my husband. I can't handle it. So you just decide which day, which one takes precedence. And you just figure out which ball you absolutely can't drop and which one, if you do whatever, it's okay. Like, I don't care if my kids occasionally watch too much TV because I have to do this or, you know, we'll make up for it on another day. It's not a big deal. Um, so you, there's no such thing as balance. It's more juggling. And you just never know where your career is going to take you. So three years ago, I was doing none of these things that I shared with you before that are now a huge part of my identity. The reason why I'm talking to you today, and they bring me significant satisfaction, even though they take up more time. Um, it's because I truly enjoy them. So I don't want you to think that you have to have your path figured out right now, because none of these things were in existence or were even in the forefront of my mind when I was going into med medicine or medical school or anything like that. So just say no and be firm. but know that different doors exist and you never want to burn bridges because you never know when something might actually be totally perfect for you in five years or in 10 years. Um, I think that's a really good piece of advice. And with the theme of unity in medicine, um, I just want to touch on this for this conference. We need everyone when it comes to caring for patients. So I'm talking about being a physician, but I want you to know that along the way, we need everybody from the housekeepers to the CEOs although they piss me off lately, they're getting huge bonuses and cutting some salaries, but whatever, we need everybody. So we need, one thing is not better than the other. A doctor is not better than a nurse, is not better than an occupational therapist, is not better than a nurse practitioner. Um, we all need to work together and it's about you figuring out where you fit best into medicine. And I don't want you to think that you should strive to be a physician because that's like at the top of a hierarchy. I can call a stat C-section, but I can't physically start it unless my nurse is there to help me. So I'm useless without her and she's useless without me and we all work together. So I want you to understand as you go through this, respect everybody along the way because you never know who's gonna make or break you along the way. And with that, that's me. Um, you can follow me on social media or email me if you want. Um, but what I'll do is I'll stop sharing my screen and then we can take some questions. So let me uh, stop that. All righty. Yeah. Hi, Jennifer. How are Hello. you? Thank you so much for presenting. I loved yeah. that. I loved everything you had to say. It was really informative and I know oh, all of our students appreciated it as well. So we have a big Q&A going on here. So I'm just going to start reading off the questions. I'm going to look at Perfect. the ones that have the most upvotes. So if uh, our attendees are seeing the Q&A and you see a question you really want me to ask, make sure to like that so that I can see that it wants to be asked and I'll prioritize those ones. Perfect. Right, so first we have, if you had the knowledge that you have now, would you still do medicine or the same specialty? And if not, what do you think you would want to do? Yeah. Um, yeah. People ask me, what would you do if you weren't doing this? And my answer is I have no idea because nothing else satisfies me. Like people say, well, would you have chosen to be a midwife or be a physician's assistant or, and no, because I love literally every aspect of my job. So, um, I have no idea what I would do um, otherwise. And I would, even in the midst of a pandemic, even in the midst of this craziness and litigation and shenanigans, um, yeah, I would totally do it again, which is a completely different answer from when I was working that first full-time job out of residency. And I came home from work every day crying so mad that I had set myself up for this career. Um, so I figured out a way to make it work, um, but yeah. Absolutely. And look where you are now. It all worked out for the best. It does. It does. If you, you know, it's not luck. So I think people are just like, you got to work hard. You got to be okay saying no, you have to, um, I mean, some of it certainly is and, and yeah, but it's, it takes work to get yourself Absolutely. in the right spot. Perseverance. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay. One of my other popular questions are, were you certain when choosing your path in undergraduate school or did you eventually find what you wanted to pursue after experiences? Yeah, I had wanted to be a doctor ever since I was growing up. And I think my parents just told me that. And then I in, internalized it. And then it actually turned out to be true. I think that they were just like, that sounds like a good job. Let's tell a three-year-old that. And then she'll want to be that. And I actually was into it. Um, I did go to a conference, the National Youth Leadership Forum on Medicine in high school, right before college. And um, 
it was like an in-person version of this. And we did a lot of conference stuff and the medical students I met who were from Harvard, I'm not saying that Harvard is miserable, but this particular group of students were so miserable that I left the conference, not wanting to be in medicine. And I thought, well, I'll do medical writing. And that lasted like two months because once I started college taking my courses, I was like, well, I think they were just having a bad day. So there was like a very short amount of time where I didn't want to do it. Um, but then other than that, yeah. Absolutely. Um, let's see. My next question for you is, let's see, what habits or mindsets have empowered you in your journey to and within medicine? Ooh, that's a good question, Josh. Very good. <laughs> um, I would say my habits are, and I don't think you have to do this to be successful, but I'm a very organized list-based thinking 10 steps ahead kind of person, which is, I think why I'm an obstetrician, because I think of all the worst case outcomes and I prepare for them. Um, so I, the way that I was empowered was I understood the process. So I understood what I needed to do to get into a good college. Then I understood what I needed to do to get into medical school, had a plan, had it all laid out. I clearly didn't understand how to study for the MCAT well, cause I did terrible. So just because I did that doesn't mean I always did well, but I always knew what my next steps were. And I was always thinking about that. My husband, on the other hand, went to Brown and did mediocre and halfway through was like, I think I'll be a doctor. And his advisor told him he'd be terrible. And he of course took the MCAT and did beautifully, whatever. Um, but he took a year off cause he was like, I need to spruce up my application. And once he went into that mindset, then he turned it on. So I don't think you have to be as organized as I was. My other habit was that I am not the best obstetrician in the world. I'm not. I don't think anybody, you know, I just think if you walk around thinking you're the best at something, unless you truly are, maybe you're like Simone Biles and like, you know, but I've always been the hardest worker. So when my, my residents would say, show up to rounds at 6am, I was there at 530. If they told me to present on two topics, I had three ready. I always did a little extra because that's what matters to me. When I see somebody who is trying to go into training, the fact that they're going to like, I'm not saying you need to you know, work yourself to death and be a workaholic. But I think to be successful is that you just show that you're always going to be a hard worker, even in the hard times. Um, because even if I didn't always know the answers, they knew that I would always find the answer. Um, so I think that habit was actually really huge. And that's why in my interview at Tulane, when they're like, what happened to the MCAT? I was like, I know, but here's five other ways how I can show you that that was just a day. Here's a, that was one snapshot. Here's me overall. And here's why you should still take me. Um, so I think that's important. Absolutely. I love that answer. And I really appreciate that you brought up your husband's path as well. It's really interesting to see the comparison between the two. Oh yeah. We're like yin and yang for sure. And yet we're here doing kind of the same thing right now. So you don't have to do it one way for sure. Yeah. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another popular question I have is what are your opinions about thinking of shadowing in an ER as an undergrad student? I think if you can shadow in an ER, that's phenomenal because the ER is crazy. It is Absolutely. just, it is insanity. Um, and then you do that and you're like, okay, this is not for me because I don't like the smells and the sounds and the whatever. Or you're like, this is awesome because the ER is, it's a place. It's a, it's a whole place. It's a vibe. Um, and it's great because it's fast paced. And if you can do it, you can see complaints of all different things. Um, you know, sometimes we end up going down there and delivering a baby, which freaks the ER out, even though they can handle gunshot wounds when a baby comes out, like all house is broken loose. I don't <laughs> understand it. Um, I think that the ER is a great place. And if you can't do the ER, um, you know, other things like urgent care and just trying to think, you know, especially in a pandemic where student spots may be somewhat limited, but hopefully that's opening up, um, thinking outside the box. Can you shadow an urgent care? Can you participate at a summer camp and work at their like health tent or whatever? Can you there's just lots of different ways to do it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And if any of our attendees are interested in that kind of thing, we do have a session coming up tomorrow where we're talking about scribing and how you can get scribe yeah. positions. So there's a I lot of opportunities out there. Scribing was also not a thing that was around. And I think scribing is awesome because you are right there with the provider. Absolutely. You know the words. The hardest thing about for me for starting med school was that I learned a whole new language within a whole month of starting it. You just speak all these words that you don't understand and spending time looking them up in the dictionary. If you can scribe and like be ahead and understand how an exam and a history works, I think that is very valuable and it, it looks really good on an application if that's something you, you're into. Absolutely. I agree. Let's see. Let me find another good question for you. Okay. 
is research necessary for medical school, even if it isn't a huge personal interest of yours? No, don't do it if you don't want to do it, because people are going to tell, can very easily see through that you're doing it just to say that you did research. Um, that said, if you're into research and you want to do it, by all means, go for it. And I did in college, I did research on fish, marine biology, it had nothing to do with medicine whatsoever. And I highlighted it on my application as yeah, I know that Atlantic croaker have nothing to do with the human body, but I learned how to think scientifically, organize a project, analyze data, ask questions, and they could tell that I was passionate about it because I love talking about my research. Um, I do not like research anymore and I stay away from it, um, but there's some people who love it. So do it if you love it, but it is 100% not necessary. Mm -mm. Absolutely. I agree. I completely agree. They can tell. They can tell. Oh, yes. Oh, true. yeah. Don't, don't take it. <laughs> Mm -mm, we can, we can smell it. <laughs> Let's see. I have an anonymous question. Yeah. It, what's the difference between a clinic and a hospital? So a clinic is outpatient experience. So that's where you go for your checkups, your annual exams, if you're sick. And then the hospital is inpatient medicine. So that's where you're going to go if you're having surgery or if you are, um, so that might be the emergency room. We were going to have a baby. And so um, a lot of specialties will track into what we call outpatient or clinic medicine or inpatient or hospital medicine. And some have a crossover of both like OBGYN or, you know, surgery or different things. So absolutely. Yeah. And each have their own pros and cons for sure. I mean, my husband is a private practice pediatrician. He gets to work normal hours. He hardly works any weekends except when he's on call. When he covers a holiday, it's only by the phone. Um, he might have to go round in on some babies, but then he's home by 9am. And for me, it's 24 seven, we're in the hospital. But what I love about it is that I can work some night shifts and I can work some weekends and be home with my kids on the day during the daytime. So it's totally, it's, it's also just kind of what you're interested in. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And what you can handle too, whatever mm -hmm. works for you and your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. I have another question. Um, someone asked, could you talk more about how pursuing a career as a physician influences your retirement plans? Mm. Oh, I yes. haven't thought about that before. So yeah, I actually had a little bit on this and then I took it out. Um, cause I thought I might run long on time. Um, it does. And so you need to think about this. And if there's one other thing that you guys remember from me today is that you're going to look up what a Roth IRA is R O T H. And I'll tell you, I am the worst at finances. Like I am 1950s housewife when it comes to understanding my finances. And I'm okay with that because I can't be good at everything. And my husband helps me with that. But what I do know is that you are going to have a delayed income and you're going to have loan payback, but it is so important to start paying yourself by investing from day one. If you can do it in medical school, cool, but absolutely when you're a resident. And the reason I mentioned that Roth IRA is that you can only contribute to that when you're under a certain income. And your residency income will absolutely make you in that income. But once you start an attending job, you can't contribute. Maxing that out and starting when you're in your 20s, it will exponentially increase. If you wait 10 more years, you're delaying that exponential increase another 10 years. So you might even not be putting in a whole lot. By the time you get to your 60s, you've got a nice setup for some of your retirement. And then always along the way, figuring that out. Um, I had a slide like, how do you make medicine work financially when you're part-time? You live within your means. You pay yourself first, you invest. Um, you don't buy a Tesla right away. I mean, my husband just got a new car. He'd been driving a 2001 Honda Civic since till a couple weeks ago. And we joked, we're like, you can see all the, you know, the Porsche and the whatever and the doctor's parking lot. And probably those are neurosurgeons or radiologists. And then there's like the general pediatricians, but it's also the smart people just don't spend money on silly things like that, that depreciate. Um, so you can do it. I think getting a financial planner, even in residency is huge. Um, and I wish that in medicine, they taught us more about the business of medicine and the financial aspects of it. So if you can do that, read the white coast, white coat investor. It's a fantastic Ooh. book. I book haven't read it, but my husband's read it. Book recommendation. Yes. The white coat investor written by a physician. Um, again, I don't read these things. My husband does. And then I just benefit from them. So, or marry somebody who's really good. At finances. <laughs> it's not very, so it's not very, that, you know, partner. like <laughs> hashtag feminist, but whatever. I'm fine with it. I can't be good at everything. <laughs> <laughs> no. Wow. Well, that's a really good question. I'm glad somebody asked that. Yeah. I mm -hmm. didn't even think about it. So I think yeah. it's a good question too. And yeah. it kind of leads into my next question. Let's talk about feminism. How do you perceive and address bias and opinion guided care as a woman to yeah. other women? And how mm -hmm. do you actively separate your opinion while providing healthcare? Yeah, I think that is huge. I think that they should get rid of the 
physics requirement and the chemistry requirement on the MCAT and not just because they did terrible, but also because <laughs> you'll learn the science you need to know in med school. They should screen for people who don't know how to communicate and don't know how to have empathy and don't know how to see other people who might not be the same, whether it's skin color or socioeconomic status or gender and be able to treat them as humans. I'm sorry, you do not belong in medicine if you do not understand that there that gender is a spectrum or that people can have different sexual orientations and be still totally worthy of good care. Um, I have very strong opinions about that because I think that everybody deserves to have good unbiased care. Now I'm not perfect and I acknowledge that I know I carry bias, we all do, what we call implicit bias. And so it's working on that and it's, um, practicing and understanding that sometimes you're not going to get it right. It's owning that you're not perfect. It's reading books and, and going to seminars and constantly educating yourself. Um, I, you know, how I told you how in the beginning, I felt so ashamed when I was going to tell my partners, my male older partners that I was going to cut back. And I responded in such a shrinking way. And I apologized and today, when I tell people, like today, when I said my back hurts, I could push through and, and deliver shitty care tomorrow because I'm, you know, we always fight through and we never take a day off. I'm not going to do that to myself because that's just not worth it. And if somebody wants to think I'm weak because of that, you know, opinions are like assholes. There's everybody's got one and not all of them are useful. So I'm sorry to be very <laughs> frank, but you just need to understand that you are the only advocate for you. And so if somebody treats you like garbage because of, you know, your skin color or your gender in medicine. Um, you know, we get that as obstetricians a lot when we have, sometimes we have people come in consult and, um, you know, I had this one trauma surgeon who said, Oh, I thought you were the nurse because you're so young and you don't have a white coat on. And I said, yeah, but I'm the one who's going to come and get this baby out in 30 seconds while you stand there in the corner and don't know what to do. Like, you know, so how about we do less talking and more working? And so I'm very upfront. And I think just once you get comfortable and you let the imposter syndrome go, you know, but I'm also from New York. That helps. <laughs> York, Hopefully I didn't offend anybody here, but I think it's really important that you speak up for yourself. Um, I agree. You know, I feel like we could just have a session on inspirational quotes, from <laughs> <laughs> which I have been taught. And I also, I've had mentors who have shown me like, Oh, okay. You know, you just, you, you know, you deserve to be treated like a human, even when you are the lowest person on the totem pole. So you do. It's very mm -hmm. true. That's something that I feel like is getting pushed across more. Mm -hmm. I think so. I definitely think it's different even from 10 years ago when I was in training. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's really nice to see too. Yeah. It's about it time, Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask one last question okay. and then we're going to have to finish up. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. This one's pretty general. I kind of like okay. it though. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your 12 hour shifts and how those work and how you manage that and handle that? Yeah. So our shifts work, they're seven to seven. So you either do day or night and shift change is a really dangerous time for patients because you're getting new nurses and new physicians and new everybody. And so that sign out is so critical. So giving a complete thorough yet concise sign out, I don't want to know all the crazy stuff that has nothing to do with this hospitalization. Um, but I get patients turned over to me. So anybody who's in triage and is still being evaluated, anybody in labor, anybody postpartum, I need to round on, um, as hospitalists, we respond to emergencies for all patients. So my coworker who's leaving will give me a heads up, like, Hey, room 25, you know, her blood pressures are a little high and they're treating them, but I just want you to be aware. And room 26, um, is a VBAC, you know, or a trial of labor after cesarean. So there's some higher risk there. So we're always, we have our radar. And then I kind of put my things into most acute to less acute. And I work through that while dealing with any new patients, new phone calls. Communication is huge. Um, I work with amazing nurses and we all get along really well together. And I think that's critical because they know me as like a human. They know my kids, they know my family. So they're not afraid to call me if something doesn't feel right. As opposed to if you're that jerk of a person who like, oh, we don't want to call Dr. So-and-so she's going to yell at us. So you know, I'll walk around the unit and say, Hey guys, I'm here. Any concerns, whatever. We'll chit chat. Um, we'll make our plan where we're ordering food from that night. Cause that's very important. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. And then, you know, the day there's scheduled work during the day, scheduled C-sections, scheduled deliveries. Um, there's consults, there's transfer of care at night. There's less scheduled stuff, but that's also when more stuff walks in the door. Um, we have safety huddles throughout the shift where we all meet as a group with the nurses and anesthesiologists, um, get to deliver some babies, do some fun things. Um, yeah, it's every, no shift is the same, which I love. 
Um, it's not like a clinic day where you're always seeing patients. Um, but also it can be crazy, but I'll have a 12 hour shift where my day is pretty fine and I can get some journal reading done. And then I'll have another day where I don't sit down at all. And I'm like, why did I sign up for this? And then I realized like, it's cool because I'm only working 12 hours. I don't do 24 hour shifts anymore. I think those are barbaric and need to go away. Um, from a safety perspective, and I'm going to be off for another two days. So it's like, it killed me for 12 hours. I'm fine. Cause I have enough time to recover. It's not like I'm doing this five days in a row. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Something that really came across to me in your explanation was the importance of teamwork during your 12 mm-hmm. hours. Totally. And I love that. Healthcare yeah. should be a community. It's absolutely it's all about that teamwork and working together yep. and bouncing off of each other. Yep. And it's not being too stuck up. Like I said, I'm not the best. Nobody really is. I'm not afraid you know, there are other OBs in the hospital where I'm like, can I just run this by you? Am I missing something? Or, you know, or they come to me and they're like, I can't get this bleeder to stop. Can you please come in? And I'm like, oh, sure. And I get it right away because it's just a different pair of eyes. It's not because I'm any better. And I love that we have that because patients are the ones who win when you get your ego out of the way. I've seen so many cases where doctors were afraid to ask for help. Um, and you have to, because there's no, there's no need in this day and age to go it alone for sure. Truly. There truly isn't. Well, on that wonderful note, I am going to end our presentation with Dr. Lincoln. Thank you so much again for presenting for us and answering all our questions. Oh, thank you guys for having me. Super fun. Highlight of my day. Now I have to go back to the kids, but it's all good. (laughs) Go back to the kids and rest. And I hope your back starts to feel better. We'll be good. We'll be good. I'll make it. (laughs) Thanks guys. Thanks for having me. Have a good one. Thank you so much. Bye.